This is a, a new DFID funding project looking at the Brazilian development model, what we understand by that, and how it might be applied to the African context. Um, and what we're doing here is very much providing an overview of the project and some of the concepts that will be driving it. Uh, this is not a detailed empirical paper. That, and in fact, 15 other such papers will come later. So hopefully we'll be back next year or the year after to bore you with some of those. But for the time being, this is really more of a conceptual overview, just to put everyone in the picture about the project and to show some of our thinking. And we very much look forward to your feedback and comments afterwards. So the background to this is that there's been a marked improvement in the social and economic indicators in Brazil in terms of economic growth, public finances, poverty, and inequality. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Brazilian economy, I mean, this is obviously a conference on Africa, um, I put together some statistics that might give you a view of what's been happening and why we think this is interesting. So we'll just have a look at some um, charts to begin with. As you can see, pretty good GDP annual growth in Brazil, volatile but positive, certainly compared to the 1980s, the so-called lost decade. This has been a very favorable period for growth in Brazil, despite the slowdown of the last couple of years. So this in itself calls out for some sort of interesting analysis, maybe a policy response for, from other countries. Could they learn from that experience? Could they learn from Brazil with its commodity base, its large and growing population, something that could help them? That was one of the things driving this. Also, inward FDI flows have been very substantial in Brazil. Could other countries learn from that? And we saw the FDI inflows begin to pick up massively following the stabilization of the mid-1990s. And I'm going to come back to that. But that's absolutely quite a remarkable acceleration. And again, might there be policy lessons deriving from that? And I guess of greatest concern right now here is the decline in Brazilian poverty indicators since the stabilization of the mid-1990s. It's this combination of growth and improvements in the distributional and poverty aspects which perhaps are the most salient characteristics of what's been going on in Brazil so far as other countries are concerned. So if I just back up a little bit, um, we looked at these improvements, um, but the question is, are these outcomes from a new development model in Brazil? Is there in fact such a thing as a Brazilian development model? Well, opinion is quite divided on that. Um, is it just dependent on commodity prices? Is it a commodity prices per play? Is it China driving this? Or is something else going on? Are there structural changes? Um, is the development bank actuating improvements? Why does this matter to African countries? Well, we think in a couple of ways. Firstly, Brazil is emerging as a world power and it's beginning to invest more and more in Africa and it's serving as a mouthpiece for a number of developing economies. Increasingly, Brazil is being seen as their, their spokesperson in the international community. So it seems to me that Brazil is having an increasingly big impact on the way in which countries in Africa conceptualize about themselves in the world. So how did all this come into being? Well, the Brazilian story is one of massive improvement in the last 10 years, but that followed a period of acute crisis in the 1980s, um, and that followed democratization. Since then, between the mid-1990s, we had this break point, and the number of things happened. The introduction of a pegged exchange rate, limited fiscal adjustment, de-indexation, all this brought about the end of hyperinflation, and then we had trade and market liberalization, which opened up the Brazilian economy to the rest of the world and imposed competitive improvements in that economy. Since then, of course, we've had this improvement in performance, and we looked at that earlier in terms of the charts that I showed. But does this constitute a new model? And indeed, what are the elements of such a model? Well, we'd argue that there are a number of things at play here. Firstly, of course, there's the commodity price boost, which, of course, a number of other economies, notably in Africa, have benefited from. Second, we've had continued market reform in terms of opening up the economy to trade and investment, uh, but also in terms of improving market efficiency in a number of other areas. Next, of course, we've had fiscal policy consolidation and targeting, which have improved the fiscal performance of the economy and reduced its capacity or its ability to run up debt. And that's been extremely important in terms of improving Brazil uh, in the minds of investors as a place in which to place their, their scarce capital. 
We've also had, to some extent, a continuity from the period of uh, import substitution industrialization, which preceded the crisis of the 80s, where the state has continued to drive selected improvements in industrial capacity and uh, diversification through a mixture of import protection measures, but of course also direct industrial and technological policy. So there's been a, a large element of continuity um, as far as the Brazilian experience has been concerned. Um, and, and we believe, and uh, my colleague will pick up on this, that this is one of the most salient features of the Brazilian success story. Yes, they've been through a period of rupture. Yes, they had a program of stabilization. Yes, they've opened up to the rest of the world. Yes, it's a much more market-driven economy than it was 30 or 40 years ago. But at the same time, the state has remained, retained the capacity to act and to drive change and to engage in a constructive um, engagement with the global economy. And we think these are pretty important features. And in terms of the social outcomes um, that we looked at, in terms of the distribution of income, but of course the reduction of the incidence in poverty, and we had, we had of course a chart just a few moments ago, there are a number of drivers here, some of which are to do with the macroeconomy, some of which are to do with the reduction in the rate of inflation, um, the, the decent growth performance, and as we saw this morning, um, you know, in the sense of the scarcity of skilled labor issue becoming less of an issue. Um, but there's also, of course, uh, been a whole range of activist social policies, notably the Bolsa Familia, which have um, given people opportunities that they never had before. It's had a very, very big impact on the, the bottom quintile of the income distribution, um, and it's been driving a lot of change. And allied to that, in terms of the redistributional story, um, is the emergence of a so-called new middle class in Brazil, which I would argue has the capacity to lead to quite significant political and social as well as economic change over the next few years. So one interesting question, it seems to me, from all of this, quite apart from the direct poverty alleviation agenda, is, well, how can societies create their own new middle classes? Could Africa potentially learn from that? And does the Brazilian experience um, have anything um, to teach Africa in that regard? And, and should, indeed, African countries be paying attention? Um, so the question then is, okay, if there is something to learn, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to suggest to you that there might be, um, how was this model developed and sustained? How did this happen over this long period of time? Well, we argue that there are a number of things going on in Brazil, again, which may serve as potential learning points for Africa. The first point is the continuity. Well, I've talked about that perhaps for too long, so I'll just leave that. But it's there. Second, I think, allied to that is a political consensus across the parties which has been focused on incremental and inclusive reform. The third one, and I guess we see this in the case of many sub-Saharan African economies, is a favourable external market, especially for key commodity exports. And that's driven demand, it's driven foreign exchange availability, and, and that's opened up some fiscal space for targeted spending. And next we have, of course, improvements in supply-side capacity, and these have been driven by liberal reforms in the 90s. So the economy is increasingly able to compete in the global marketplace, not just in commodities, but in higher value-added manufactured products, like the plane that Armando, flew into, Armando and I flew into Helsinki on from Manchester was a Brazilian-built plane. And that is an embodiment of this ability of these competitive market reforms allied to strategic state intervention to drive the emergence of new sectors. Could Africa have something to learn from that, as well as the, you know, the sort of straight commodity export story? The answer is maybe. We have to find out. I think the other thing, if we think back to the FDI chart, this is this idea of a huge surge in FDI and that has been leveraged, used, to realize improvements in competitiveness. So this has led to, in a number of sectors, improved supply-side responsiveness. Now, of course, there are supply-side inelasticities, especially so far as um, the issue of infrastructure is concerned, and that's a very, very big issue right now. But in other sectors, non-infrastructure sectors, there's no doubt that, in particular, with the ingress of FDI, that has led to a much more competitive um, export base. Again, could African economies have anything to learn from that?
So far as the social agenda, well, how has this been financed? How have these direct poverty alleviation and CCT policies been financed? Well, we argue this is partly down to the robustness of the tax regime and revenue collection um, over the past 10 years, and in particular, the quite strong incidence in Brazil relative to other emerging and developing economies of social taxes, payroll taxes, and taxes which are essentially hypothecated to finance particular uh, modes of social spending. And we think this is really quite a critical area. Um, it's, it's somehow the capacity of the state to raise tax revenues and then to uh, apply them in areas where they might have greater social impact. And we want to really get to the bottom of um, you know, how this has been able to happen in Brazil and, and, again, what might Africa have to learn from it. And lastly, um, and this is, I guess, where Brazil has perhaps fallen uh, more short of the mark than in some of these other areas that I've mentioned, there's the area of human capital and education. And there have been some improvements there, and the Bolsa Familia, of course, because it's conditioned on keeping your kids in school, uh, the, uh, the evidence is that it's beginning to have a favourable impact. But compared with other countries, certainly other emerging market econ economies in Asia, uh, Brazil's record on education and human capital formation is not very favourable. Um, so is it possible to learn from that experience, learn from the failures, and learn from what Brazil is attempting to do right now to address those failures? So this is really some of the agenda um, or some of the sort of key drivers, as we see it, um, underpinning Brazil's comparative success over the last um, 10 years or so. And uh, what Armando is going to do now is to pick up more specifically on the social agenda and look uh, particularly at the impacts on poverty and what the government's been doing. And we'll have a, just a quick microphone changeover. So um, two minutes and we'll be right back. Okay. Um, right. Um, the, um, um, the reason for the changeover is that perhaps what is um, particularly uh, distinct about the, um, if, uh, the a Brazilian development model, if, if there is one, uh, is the way in which social policy has been articulated w within um, other economic policies. And I want to spend uh, about three, three minutes, three or four minutes, just providing you with an insight into how that um, has worked. Now, uh, we know from the um, presentations that we heard over, over today and, and yesterday that um, you know a great deal about Bolsa Familia. It's a very large uh, program that provides transfers to um, families that are in extreme poverty in Brazil. It's, it's a very, as I said, the largest scale program. It reaches about a quarter of the population in Brazil, um, over 13 million beneficiaries. Uh, but what people don't perhaps uh, know so much from outside is that this is really a fraction of the kind of social policies that get, have been put in place. There is, for instance, a non-contributory pension that covers informal um, workers in, in rural areas, uh, workers in fishing, um, in mining, um, and, and of course in agriculture, that uh, provides um, uh, pensions and, and health care uh, insurance for about 7 million beneficiaries in Brazil. It's probably one of the largest and one of, it's a unique uh, program because it, it addresses particularly the needs of informal workers. And uh, for non-informal workers um, uh, or, or particularly rate, rate are raised, there is another non-contributory pension that covers them and disabled uh, families, which um, covers some over 3.5 million uh, beneficiaries. So in fact, Bolsa Familia is only one part of the much larger um, um, uh, set of um, anti-poverty programs that are there to help uh, Brazilians in poverty. But what is interesting, um, as much as the, kind of the, the size of the effort, of the government effort, is to have a look at how that is articulated within the other uh, policies. I mean, is, is social policy in Brazil part of this new development model? I think it's interesting to look at the uh, taxation uh, side, because not only that provides the 
um, uh, finance to uh, introduce and expand this program, but also because it provides for financial inclusion of people in poverty. You can see from that figure that the tax to GDP ratio has increased by around 10 percentage points in Brazil from about 22% in 1991 to about 32% in 2010. That is very significant. The tax collection capacity of Brazil is equivalent to that of southern European countries. Uh, so that, and in part explain, explains the demonstrations in Brazil in June this year, because clearly people require from government much better quality services for the kind of tax, uh, uh, tax GDP ratio that they have. I notice also that the, the outcome in terms of the decline in the Gini, or decline of around 10% from um, about 1996 um, onwards. It's interesting to look at the way in which the tax applies to different details of, of, of household income. Uh, you have there in the, in the red, uh, that is direct taxation, and in the blue you have indirect taxation. Notice that overall uh, the, uh, kind of the tax burden is re relatively flat. It's not really very, taxes are not very progressive in Brazil. Uh, but you can see that the uh, direct taxes are slightly more progressive because you have personal income tax that covers the top uh, two decils of income. But even people in the first decile of income uh, pay in, uh, taxes, uh, direct taxes through, for example, taxes on vehicles and taxes on property too. The uh, indirect taxes, as you can see, are very regressive. And, and that perhaps is an interesting point to have in mind because um, trying to make both the tax system and the benefit system progressive is a really big ask. Uh, in the case of Brazil, what has been progressive is much more the expenditure side rather than the tax side. Amanda. Yeah. <clears throat> the other point that I wanted to make, and, and of course, you know, going back to the, my previous uh, picture, the, the issue of financial inclusion is really important. Uh, because people in the, in the first decile of income uh, do contribute to tax. Um, and, 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 and that is um, an important part of the story in terms of how the uh, expenditure side and the benefit systems works. Uh, the other point to make is that social policies are extremely productivist in Brazil. Um, this is, um, these are some figures on the increase in income from 2003 to 2009 for the bottom quintile. Um, of, of uh, income earners. You can see there that there has been an increase both in work-related income um, and also in non-work-related income per adults. So, in fact, the this, this, this story about poverty reduction in Brazil and inclusive growth is not just about redistribution. It's also about improvements in labor market opportunities for people in uh, low-income uh, low and informal groups. If you, if you look at that, there has been an increase in work-related uh, income between those two years of about 60% and an increase of uh, non-work-related income, probably the transfers, which is about 100%. So, so there are those three things that are important. First of all, the, the increase in the tax collection capacity. Secondly, the fact that taxation is not really very progressive, but it does <coughs> do the job of generating income uh, and generates also financial inclusion, and also the, the issue uh, uh, about the kind of productivist nature of, the, of, of social policy. Late, uh, rates of labor force participation among people we participated in Bolsa Familia are actually around the same as people who are not in Bolsa Familia. So rates of labor force participation are very significant among these groups. Um, uh, let me try to recap um, very briefly on, 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 the, on the when, uh, what, and the how. The when, I think we know. If there is a Brazilian development model, 1995, 1996 is where the break happens. We know much less about the what. What are the different components of this model? And this is going to be a very important part of our research program. <coughs> uh, we know very, very little about the how particularly the articulation of political regime, economic policies, is an area that requires a lot more work. So um, that is what we have. And in terms of the lessons for Africa, it's far too early, but we thought that uh, we might provide a few of the very pre preliminary areas that we think are important. Um, the cross-cutting national consensus in Brazil has been a really important uh, part of fiscal stabilization. <coughs> 
and, and also in terms of the support and sustainability of um, inclusive growth. Uh, tax, taxation is really important. It's a really important part of the story. And there is a question mark there, particularly in, in the context of African economies, where uh, natural resources uh, are going to provide much of the revenue in the future, the additional revenue in the future for governments. That is a really important area. Uh, large scale productivist social policies that has already been put on the table by several speakers uh, during the last two days. And of course, one, one thing to learn about Brazil that Brazil hasn't done very well is, is in terms of free infrastructure and particularly the quality of education that requires particular attention. Thank you. I just put it up. So very good.